Father, we realize that for centuries people have been saying that you are here, and we know that you have always been here in a certain particular way. Because the Apostle Paul said, in him we live and move and have our very being, that you have made all things, and by you all things are maintained. And then, Lord, by the pillar of fire you were with Israel, though you had to leave them. And then, after the birth of the New Testament church, you were with the saints by filling them, giving them a portion of your spirit. But we know at the end time there was to be and is and has been an appearing of your presence, Lord, in the pillar of fire, which we know was vindicated. And, Lord, here we are at this hour, and we are not yet truly solemn and sober and believing concerning that, Lord, that all things are possible now that you are present. And we know that the all things possible, Lord, are what you've laid down in your word because <clears throat> we have not been given the right, Lord, to ask of you those things which you have not set forth in your word. So we pray this morning you'll encourage our hearts somehow. We don't know how you're going to do it. How you bring forth the word, whatever, Lord, but encourage our hearts in such a way to exalt, exalt your presence, Lord, and exult in it, O God, and to be very serious and sober concerning it. And the word of truth, Lord, that is, come forth in this hour. So, Father, we just ask you now to help us bring our thoughts together and say those things, Lord. <clears throat> Though they be deep, may be deep and profound, we don't know that's according to what you give us, but may they be easily understood. In all things, therefore, in the remainder of this service, we commit ourselves to you, trusting that you will help us. In Jesus' name we pray, man. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, we're right up to about number 22, I believe it is, in Who is This Melchizedek? And uh, just backgrounding a bit <clears throat> on the subject, who is this particular person? Uh, Brother Branham took for his reading in the book of Hebrews, the seventh chapter, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom, that's Melchizedek, Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, <clears throat> without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, neither end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now we know that the uh, understanding that the theologian, the scholars have of this particular portion of Scripture is that wherein it says, without father, without mother, it means that this man did not have any genealogy that anybody could possibly trace. And then when it says, also, <clears throat> having neither beginning of days nor end of life, it means that they don't know when he was born and when he died. And then, because he had no children, no issue, because he was cut off evidently somehow. Uh, there is no record whatsoever of him, but evidently he was some kind of a priest unto the Most High God, which is very strange because God had separated himself to Abraham and Abraham to himself, so it is not logical to believe, though the theologians are very logical thinkers according to their own thinking, it is not scriptural logical to believe that there would be a priest who could minister to Abraham, a priest of the Most High God. <clears throat> so, you understand what I'm saying? That God recognized Abraham and Abraham alone. So how could he have had a priest to minister to Abraham? It's ridiculous. Couldn't have. So, <clears throat> when you look at this person as merely a human being, without a genealogy, without issue, a once and for all priest, and then they have the nerve to go to the 
book of Hebrews, the rest of this here, having studied Genesis, and call it a priesthood, <clears throat> that's more than I can figure, because one priest does not constitute a priesthood. Because you're looking at a lineage and you're looking down the road. So, Brother Branham, being a vindicated prophet, and we believe that he opened the seven seals, and especially number seven, under which were the seven thunders, categorically states that this person, Melchizedek, was literally God in a human form. Now, this maybe stumbles people, but <clears throat> it isn't necessary to be stumbled on the grounds of Genesis 18, which follows Genesis 14, where Melchizedek appeared to Abraham. Now, it says here in verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham in the plains of Mamre, as Abraham sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant, and so on. <clears throat> You'll find out in reading the rest of this that one of those men that as Brother Branham said, ate the flesh of the calf and drank the milk of the cow. One of those men was actually called Elohim. And two of them were angels that went down to Sodom to deliver Lot and destroy that filthy city along with Gomorrah. For it says in <clears throat> The 14th verse, after Abraham and God, this person had talked together about Abraham having a son by Sarah, which had been promised him by God, the Sarah laughed. She evidently didn't really recognize God the way Abraham did, Elohim. And she laughed, and Abraham said, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed will I return. Now, what was the time appointed? When she would be changed back to a young lady and he to a young man. Because it's utterly ridiculous to think that God would have a 90-year-old woman have a baby. That's the utmost of stupidity. And it's utmost stupidity to believe that a Gentile king, Philistine king, would want a 90-year-old doty grandma for a beautiful young wife. Now, I know the world's perverted today, and we see that today. She. <clears throat> well, when you see people like Cher and the rest of them marry 45 years old, shacked up with 23-year-olds, I guess you figure Grandma at 90 could grab an 18-year-old, I guess. I don't know. Uh, per stupid today, but that king wasn't stupid. He had his choice of the fairest in the land. So she was changed back to a young woman. We know that. Brother Branham saw that, revealed that to us, the opening of the seals. <clears throat> now, what we're looking at here then is the fact that God, when he so desired, took upon himself some exterior form that people like you and me, Abraham and so on, because we're human, could apprehend it. In other words, say now, I can communicate and uh, I'm beginning to understand there is something here, then God would begin to communicate His Word to whomever He desired to communicate it. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice if you carefully read the Scripture, in the book of Genesis, you will find that God was constantly appearing in some form to somebody. Maybe a pillar of fire, maybe a cloud, could be a whirlwind, mostly human factor is what he used. Now, when you get to the book of Exodus, you'll find again that God is using a factor 
that he can communicate to man through, which in the case I'm speaking, is a pillar of fire in a bush as he attracted Moses. And having attracted Moses, <clears throat> he sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel with tremendous signs and wonders which would convince Israel and the Egyptians that God had spoken to Moses and would do through Moses what God said he would do. Now that was the idea. But on top of that, God literally appeared in a pillar of fire with great thunderings and lightning and earthquakes from Mount Sinai. So they literally heard the voice of God and literally saw what God allowed them to see because no man can truly see God and live. It isn't necessary anyway. <clears throat> now Israel was so affrighted by that that they said, all right, we don't want to see God anymore. We don't want to hear God anymore. We believe in Abraham. We believe in Isaac. We believe in Jacob. We believe in you, Moses. Why don't you go to God and say, look, God, here's what you do if you don't mind doing it. You speak to Moses, and then he'll speak to us. And God said that's exactly the way it's going to be from now on. God speaking in a prophet and through a prophet, and Paul speaking in the book of Hebrews tells us that God was in the prophets. So therefore, God was not so much anymore in a whirlwind. <clears throat> God was not so much anymore in a pillar of fire. But God was basically and intrinsically in the prophet to speak to the people, he becoming God to the people, but God reserving his rights to be in a pillar of fire or a whirlwind or a cloud or a voice, whatever way he wanted to deal with the prophet who would then in turn deal with the people. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to bring to your attention here is the fact then that if Brother Branham came on the scene as a vindicated prophet with thus set the Lord, and here's what I don't understand about people like this Mr. Weaver writing a book on Brother Branham and writing against him and taking the word of some fellow in Germany who believed that Brother Branham was in spiritism and defiantly told the world that Brother Branham was a mesmerizer, <clears throat> that he was maybe a necromancer, a witch, or God knows what, and dare to defile the name of God to this extent that William Branham used the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and God backed it up. What kind of a God is that? I wouldn't give you two bits or a needle in a haystack for a God like that because it shows he hasn't got any integrity. Let me tell you something. This man, Mr., I forget his name. Not try, can't remember, so I won't try. But that man will perish in the lake of fire after having suffered for impugning God and making God a liar and making the devil a healer. People just don't want to believe God's word. <clears throat> So therefore, a vindicated man, and that is a picture taken by a photographer. He didn't even know he was taking it. Checked out by George J. Lacey with every single conceivable <clears throat> type of expert analysis and said that is a picture of a supernatural being and the first one in history. Now, you can do what you want about it. But when a man comes in the name of the Lord, and the thing that he says come to pass, God says, that is the man you listen to. And I care for no German theologian. I care for no German period, theologian or not, or any Irishman or anybody else, or any color that comes against the word of the living God. <clears throat> so we're looking at a vindicated prophet who said that Melchizedek, without father, without mother, would have to have been a direct creation of God. Not simply one without a genealogy, <clears throat> without descent. That tells you he didn't come from anybody. 
and he didn't have any issue. So he was made like unto the Son of God as a perfect type. And I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus Christ, when it comes to his conception, when it comes to his beginnings, did he have a father called Joseph and a woman called Mary for his mother, wherein jo Joseph supplied the sperm and Mary supplied the egg, and brought forth a child. Now, anybody that thinks that Mary supplied the egg is a complete fool. And anybody that thinks that Joseph supplied the sperm is even a greater fool. Because you're dealing with a virgin birth. And the virgin birth, it means without male intervention and goes further than that. A woman cannot have a child by herself she does not have the proper chromosomes. I think X chromosome belongs to both male and female. So by parthogenesis, she might possibly have a baby girl, which is impossible as far as we know. But she could never have a male child because women don't have the chromosome. So then did Mary have an egg? No. Then what was she? She was an incubator. So now we have Jesus without a father and without a mother. <clears throat> We're speaking now in terms of a descent. The only father he could possibly have was a creatorial father or creator father that could have produced that body. So you see, if you don't understand Scripture, you can get all mixed up. You could say, well, this fellow here, he just happened on the scene. Nobody has anything about him. Nobody knows. We just let it go with that. But when you go right into Scripture, you begin to understand when you've got a prophet to give you the keys and all the clues to it. <clears throat> you can find here that this one here, which is the beginning of the priesthood, and there was no continuation, and he would have been the head of that priesthood. But you notice it says that Jesus became the head of that priesthood. Now, how did he get it? Well, we get into that later on if we got time. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we're looking at the statement that Brother Branham made. This one here was literally God, God himself, who made himself a figure like unto a man. It was a human figure that stood there, and God himself was that person. Now, you notice, in plain English, what we're telling you then, that Melchizedek is another name for God. And the name for God at this particular point and in this revelation is king of righteousness and king of peace. And at the same time, he was a priest ministering. So we see the perfect picture of Jesus in the flesh. The created egg and sperm from the very life of Almighty God himself being a king of righteousness and a king of peace and ministering. Ministering from God to man. Now you notice in here that this one offered the elements of the shed blood and the broken body. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ will offer again the elements of the shed blood and the broken body, he himself, to us when he is king of righteousness and king of peace. Now, that's what he's going to do. So you've got a beautiful reality here, and you've got a beautiful reality in Christ. You've got a type here, and you've got a fulfillment in Christ, <clears throat> what we are looking at. Now, let's try to bring some more thoughts out here. We want to go back to the book of Hebrews again, and we're going to look at chapter... <clears throat> uh, let's see. Let's look at chapter 11. <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 8 to 10. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, 
as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, <clears throat> whose builder and maker is God. Now, what Abraham was looking for, according to this scripture, was a city <clears throat> that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But let's go back to Rome, to a big your pardon, Genesis, <clears throat> the 12th chapter. And here we find what God said to Abraham. Get thee a verse 1 of 12. Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. <clears throat> now you notice that the Genesis, or the beginning, is in Abraham and not in his father. So therefore, there is now a genealogy <clears throat> which Abraham himself was heir to a genealogy right back to Adam, right back to Adam through Seth, <clears throat> right on down the line. But God draws a line at the time of Abram's birth. And he said, now it's going to be numbered from you. It's no longer numbered from Adam, although it still is, by the way, because you go plumb back to him. Remember, Abraham and Adam was the son of God. <clears throat> but now it comes from Abraham. He said, I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So now we have Abraham here <clears throat> as the head of, of all the redeemed, of all the earth, whether they're going to be Jews, Gentiles, red, yellow, green, black, white, purple, who cares about color or nationality or anything else? It doesn't matter. He is the one. <clears throat> so Abraham departed. <clears throat> he was Abram then. And Abram was 75 years old. He went out of Haran, took his wife Sarai, took his Lot's brother's son. All their substance went into Canaan, passed through various areas right in there. And then it says in verse 8, he removed himself thence to a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, and that's the house of God. Have in Bethel on the west and high on the east, there built an altar in the Lord, <clears throat> and called upon the name of the Lord, and then he began journeying. Now, over here in the book of Acts, I want to try to bring this together for you. Just We're looking at Abraham now, <clears throat> and he's the fellow that met Melchizedek, which was actually God in a human form. And uh, <clears throat> here's the, the martyrdom of Stephen in, in book of Acts, the 8th chapter. Uh, no, I want the 7th chapter, beg your pardon. <clears throat> and the 7th chapter, uh, he is speaking of uh, Abraham and Moses and the very, the very genealogy of Israel. <clears throat> and it says here in the 8th verse, And he gave him the covenant circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac, and searched Isaac the eight days, and right on down and down and down. <clears throat> and he tells you of, of Abraham. Now watch, if the 5th verse is the, is the verse I was really looking for. Or you can take number four if you want. Abraham dwelt in the land of the Chaldeans. He, he went out of the land of the Chaldeans, dwelt in the land of Haran. And he stayed there until his father died. Then he went elsewhere into Canaan. And notice now in verse 5. And God gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Though he set his foot on it. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession. <clears throat> and to his seed after him. When as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise. That, that this seed should sojourn in a strange land. And so on. <clears throat> now. You'll notice that this is the book of Acts. We looked at the book of Genesis, we came to the book of Hebrews, <clears throat> and we found that Abraham was looking for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God, <clears throat> and he was heir to a land, though he walked on it, he did not have the title to it, and he could not claim it. So in his peregrinations, that's his wanderings around, <clears throat> he was looking for a place to settle. 
a place that had foundations, a place from which he wouldn't be moving any longer, a place positively <clears throat> whose builder and maker was God. Now, what city is it that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God? New Jerusalem. That's chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> now, why I'm saying all this is to bring you back to the seventh chapter of this king. Now, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem, priest, that's peace, priest of the Most High God, a priest king, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. <clears throat> now, this is the perfect type of the Lord Jesus Christ. See? God dwelling in flesh. God dwelling in a human being. And that's what we're looking at. Is God, as Brother Brano said, with the skin on it. It's not badger skins anymore. It's not goat skins of the tabernacle. It's a human skin. Just like God was in the prophets. Now, <clears throat> God was in this man. Now, he is a king. <clears throat> now, let's look at the word king. To be a king, you've got to have some type of a kingdom or you're not a king. See, you've got to have a kingdom. <clears throat> you've got to have that which pertains to a kingdom. So, therefore, as we look at this particular person here, he must have had a retinue. He must have had a city. <clears throat> he must have had something to match with his title, which was King of Salem, King of Righteousness, Priest of the Most High God. Because look, how are you going to be a priest to God if there isn't something there that concerns a priesthood? Now you've got two kinds of priests. You've got a priest of God, and from God that ministers to the people. <clears throat> then you've got a priest of the people that ministers to God. In both cases, you've got God and people and somebody between. All right. Right here then, <clears throat> you have got to settle, as Brother Branham put it, you have got to find then somebody that he's ministering from and somebody ministering to, which we see right here. <clears throat> God took upon himself a form whereby he was ministering to Abraham, and you will notice that he ministered the, the bread and the wine, which is symbolic of the crushed body, the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the shed life and the shed blood. <clears throat> now that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He absolutely ministered to man. God ministering to man in the form of a man. Aaron, in a man, which was a man, ministered for men unto God. He offered the blood. <clears throat> so that Jesus Christ fulfilled both of those roles. Now, at the time I am speaking of, because I was looking down the road a couple thousand years, whatever it is, <clears throat> we are looking at a, at a king who must have had... <clears throat> a kingdom upon earth. Now, this puts God, in my understanding, from what Brother Branham taught, into a very, very peculiar light because people do not want to believe that God would do a thing like that. Now, listen to me. What's wrong with our thinking is that we do not think like God and God does not think like us and He does exactly what He wants to do when He wants to do it. How in the world could you have anybody born with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, yet John the Baptist was? How in the world could you have a condition like this, and yet there was? Now, if you're going to accept this, that this was a king, you are not going to get any historian, you will not get anybody <clears throat> to ever tell you that there is a king without a kingdom. Never has been, never will be. Because the king is the fellow that makes the kingdom, not the kingdom make the fellow. Now, if you don't understand that, then you tell me who created God. God, the great creator, is a king by virtue of the fact that he has a kingdom. 
<clears throat> Jesus is king by virtue of the fact that he has a kingdom. So therefore, by virtue of the fact there cannot be a kingdom of any description without a king. There's no way. And I look at this and I see here where God came down to earth and did something which is absolutely tremendous, <clears throat> which would be the forerunning of the city which is going to come upon earth with the 12 foundations. Now let's go back to the book of he into Hebrews again. <clears throat> We're going to go to chapter 13 at this time. Now let's read a little bit, starting with, with verse 11. It's not going to make too much sense, but it will make sense. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. <clears throat> now it tells you right there, there was a sacrifice made by the bodies of beasts for the sins of the people. The blood is taken and spilt upon an altar. The bodies are taken outside and burnt. That's one of the types of the sacrifices. Now watch, verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with, with his own blood, suffered without the gate. They took him and hung him on, they hung him on a cross outside of Jerusalem on Calvary's hill, a place called Golgotha. <clears throat> now watch. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. Go outside of the camp. Go on out. Bearing his reproach. Now notice. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now what are you looking at? I don't care where you look. When you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at a city. That's right. <clears throat> when you look at Melchizedek, who does not appear again, until he appears in Jesus, which is God in the human form, where God literally comes down and inhabits a body. Not a body like this one he lived in back in the days of Abraham, but a body wherein he deliberately, by the life of God, be moved out. And out of that moving out from the cells of the Spirit, there formed around that the material of it, which was Spirit, <clears throat> formed an egg and a sperm implanted in the womb of Mary that brought forth that child. Now it says here, you have no city, but you go on out to him and you got a city. And that's exactly what Abraham did. He moved out to get a city. We move out to get a city. Now I'm trying to show you something here that's important. <clears throat> Whether you have believed or not by reading your Bible, there is a tremendous importance in believing in the New Jerusalem. Well, I know you say, Brother Vale, I tell you what, if I could just be the sweetest, humblest Christian, and if I could be this and that, you know what I'd do? I'd forfeit that city. You Listen, you shut your mouth. You are so stupid as to be sickening, and I'm right with you. How can you say contrary to the Word of God, the shed blood of Jesus Christ that purchased all this. Amen. How can you not identify yourself? Let me read some more scripture here to show you what happened back in Genesis is real. That God did have a city. He did have a king. He did have a priest that ministered from him to us. And it doesn't change. Now, I'm going to tell you something. People are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's right, true heavenly minded. <laughs> you look in the mirror any time you want. And if you've got what God gave you, you think you got from God something, you'll say, I'm a child of God, a son of God. I don't care what it looks like anybody else looks like. You've got to say what God said about you. And you've got to look beyond your own image. They couldn't look beyond the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and see that he was that Melchizedek. He was that king of righteousness. He was that king of peace. He was that one that ministered. Sitting here this morning, do we really, really realize it too? <clears throat> now let's go a little further and read something else here. In the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, Paul is speaking of suffering with Christ. And I'm going to go into that for another whole message, which I don't have time right at this point. I've left it for down the road. <clears throat> and he warns us that there isn't one single solitary son that 
isn't corrected by the Father, whether you're a physical son born in the flesh or whether you're a spiritual son born of God. Now listen, what is the first thing that correction depends upon? Correction depends upon a rule that was not adhered to because it wasn't known and broken consequently and wasn't known. There can be no correction until, first of all, there is a standard. If there's no standard, there's no correction. I've said hundreds of times, <clears throat> I suppose I've said it hundreds of times, even to you people here, that if there's no answer, there's no problem. See? There's no problem. There can't be. Simply, you think it over. There is. There can't be. It's impossible. Another thing is there's never anything lost. It's only misplaced. We have a wrong philosophy. <clears throat> now, correction. Do you think for one minute if a father said to his child, now look, we're going to show you how to saw a piece of wood. Now, your eye isn't straight like it should be with practice, but your hand and your eye will come together eventually. In the meantime, we have a thing here called a square. <clears throat> we have a ruler. Now, the best thing to do before we cut is to see that the end of the 2 by 4 is perfectly square, or it's not going to work. So now we put the square at the end of the 2 by 4, and we can see there's maybe 15 degrees out. This is what 15 degrees is. We mark it. Fortunately, we've got a saw here. We don't even have to use our eye on it. We just put it against the square because it's square already, and we pull the straw, we pull the saw through. <clears throat> you got a radial saw, you pull it through. Say, now the end is square. Now, here's what you do. You be sure that this two by four is plumb up against this square here, this buttress here. Because if it's off, the saw is going to hit it. You could get cut. The board, the two by four, come up and knock your head off. And if by luck it doesn't do any of those things, it's going to be crooked. Because you've got to follow the rules. Now the kid's kind of a smarty pants, so he doesn't follow the rules, and he gets knocked on the head with the dude before. And the dad said, well, that's bad enough. I won't have to correct you because I think you done got corrected. Well, the boy said, and he said, now, son, look, all these marks down here, this signifies zero number of inches. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's one foot. It goes into 20 inches, 2 foot, 36, and up here it's an 8 foot length. <clears throat> now, however you want to cut that, all you got to do is put that 2 by 4 right there, and you hold it right there because the saw hasn't touched it. By the time you get where the saw is, you simply put your finger there and press it, run the saw through, you got a perfect cut. And the kid's kind of cockeyed because he's too fast. He goes down here and he puts it one inch short. Well, the father's got to correct him. I'm trying to bring out something to show you here. There's no such thing as correction unless there's something there in the first place. And the correcting of any child of God is to know the revealed word of God and to act, first of all, to believe it and then to act upon. Now, if that kid had really believed his dad, he'd have been very meticulous. Now, he'd, in fact, he'd have been so close, he'd have wiggled the thing back and forth. Dad say, now look, son, don't get nervous. It isn't all that hard. Just take it easy and just push it right up there. <clears throat> now, if a kid's real smart, by the time his dad's through teaching him, now this is just woodwork, he will have picked up a lot of things on his own. Now, you can't do that the Word of God. You can't take from you can't add to it. Now, I want to show you something here. See, we're looking at a correction. Now, God has a Word all laid down here a word that is perfectly correct that was given to us under the Apostle Paul. But in the very first church age, men and women began to leave the word until right today we have marriages and divorces, churches messed up, people's lives messed up, everything completely out of cater, <clears throat> everything out of balance, everything bad, <clears throat> so that now God did not have in this time a measuring rod for people to measure by. That's why the prophet said they could get by in all those church ages under the law of the sacrifice for ignorance. <clears throat> now, in Jesus' day and Paul's day, there was no sacrifice for ignorance. Why? Because they knew. 
Later on, <clears throat> the sacrifice ring had to come in. Now, William Branham comes on the scene as a vindicated prophet with the perfect word of God. I want to ask you a question. Then is there a sacrifice ring? His answer is no. The minute you come head on with the word of Almighty God, there is no more sacrifice. Now, God had to correct this word before he could do anything about putting a judgment upon us. <clears throat> now, after reading, and I'm not going to go through with this whole thing. After reading the Heroes of Faith in chapter 11, we get into the picture of Jesus suffering outside the gate. We see him living the entire word of God, therefore dying for you and for me, because that's living the word of God to die. <clears throat> then it's put upon you and me to believe what was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ and what was revealed to us by the prophets, as Paul said, my gospel. Okay, now let's keep moving. And he says, now he said, I tell you what. He said, you people live such lives that people cannot be led astray. Live in peace, be holy without blame, looking unto Jesus at all times, lest there be a fornicator or a profane person like Esau. Now we know that fornication and profanity is not the sexual thing and the physically immoral thing. It's a type of the spiritual. <clears throat> now he said, you be very careful. You do not get involved by going and leaving the standard that God laid down. Now, Brother Branham laid that right on the line for us. This world is judged by one Christ Jesus. He said, the judge is here. The world was already condemned. We're standing before the white throne right now. It's been all laid out. <clears throat> now, we'll get back to Melchizedek. No, we're coming to him in that city. Don't worry. Now, it says here that this fellow Esau positively, when it was too late, wanted to get what was rejected. You know, the foolish virgin come, and they come too late, and they want to get the oil. And there's only one place where the oil is, and that's in the word that they rejected. <clears throat> Do you mind? Well, I wonder. Can I stop for a while and give you a little interjection here? Something to think about? Or we're going to come back then to where they reject, the foolish virgin rejected at this point right here. <clears throat> Brother Branagh said there's a squeeze coming down. It's over the Trinitarian doctrine, which resolves itself in water baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? <clears throat> Just a minute. How many people are baptized in this world in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or Jesus' name? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Are all those people foolish virgin? The answer is no. You know as well as I do, they're not. Now, what kind of a squeeze is coming down? If they're an organization, the Catholic Church could well go back to its foundations when they baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get what I'm talking about now? Then the pressure may not be just that you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read something in 2 Timothy here. Paul says here in the 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of the Lord is not bound. Where would you and I suffer? <clears throat> because we believe that William Branham was a vindicated prophet from God. And the Catholic Church claims that for its pope. Now, what if the pope has got to go back and say, hey, we blew it. We never should have changed our water baptism. <clears throat> you can let a lot of people right in there, but you'd never let the group of people in that take the word restored in this hour. Can't do it. So that squeeze is going to be a much more tougher, much tougher squeeze than we think it is. Much more devious, much more... Problematic. I just want to let you know this morning, there's things we can look at every now and then on this squeeze coming up, which will come. Now it says here, when he would have inherited the blessing, see, he, he was rejected. Now remember, the virgins come. Now remember, there's a group of virgins that come to Jesus. And they say, Lord, open the door to us. And he said, I used to know you as my wife, but I don't know you as my wife anymore. They're rejected. <clears throat> now let's read on. I've said all of this to come to this. For you are not come to the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire and their blackness and darkness and tempest. 
And the sound of a trumpet, the voice, the words, which voice that they heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure which was, that which was commanded. See? What was commanded? The word of God laid out the plumb line. Isn't it, isn't it be wonderful to have instructions, the kind of instructions that you know if you follow them you couldn't go wrong? The 119th Psalm speaks of that. The Bible speaks of that. <clears throat> what shall I set before the young men? The word of God. They'll never go wrong. What about the young women? The word of God. They'll never go wrong. What about the old men? The word of God. They'll never go wrong. You follow the word of God, you couldn't go wrong. <clears throat> There's no way to ever go wrong with the word of God long as you follow it. Now see, and the sound of trumpet, and, and the entreated and said, don't, we don't want to hear from God anymore. It's too terrible to think of hearing from God. Let's hear through a man. That's sealed it in. Now watch. But you are come to Mount Zion. Now look at, <clears throat> over here we read it. We have no continuing city, but we seek one. How are you going to get it? You're going to go outside the camp <clears throat> where Jesus is. In the seventh church age, He's outside the church. And he doesn't go into the church. You got to go. They put him out. And they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. How can they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh unless he does something so radical? Because he was a radical. Not a hippie. Just a radical. He was so radical from the status quo, they said, get rid of him. And what's God going to do at the end time through a prophet and through a people that's so radical, they got to get rid of him. <clears throat> no continuing city. All right, now, here it says here, God having given his word, and it's not a word that passes away, because that glory faded. And remember, Israel had a great glory. <clears throat> it faded. But the glory in this hour does not fade. So you're going plumb to a city with foundations from whatever God does at this time. Now, that's what I'm driving at with Melchizedek. Because in this age, God ministers one more time to the people. Now let me show prove it. Let's keep reading. You're not come to Mount Zion, but unto this but you are come to the Mount Zion, not to Mount Sinai, unto the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem, which hath foundations, is building makes God, to an innumerable company of messengers, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's Christ's own church. The firstborn from amongst the dead, the first resurrection, that's his own church, <clears throat> which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all. Do you realize what he's saying? Since the seals are open, <clears throat> since we see the full revelation, <clears throat> the manifestation and presence of Christ, you are right now, right in face of the new Jerusalem, right in face of the lamb upon the throne, right in face of the judge that says either come in or get out. Now look at people, I'm not leading you to bleach something 10,000 years down the road. I'm trying to get you to see right now and you know it. I'm not a preacher looking down the road looking back. I'm a preacher looking now. And if you think I'm not that kind of a preacher, get yourself another one because I stand here and tell you I am. And I can prove it by my sermons that I follow the prophet right to the letter. No looking back, no looking forward. Looking right now. <clears throat> now, to the general assembly of the firstborn church, of, the church of the firstborn. In other words, you're facing right now the resurrection. And with it, you're facing the assembling together of every single New Testament and Old Testament bride. That's right. <clears throat> And before you can come on down here in the millennium, remember the 144,000 got to be disposed of because they come up as a part of the first resurrection and they serve the bride as eunuchs in the chamber. Yeah. 
for not just 1,000 years, but millions of years. <clears throat> and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, what have you got here? You have got the resurrected firstborn, and you've got the firstborn standing here that don't die. And so justified, your spirit doesn't leave you. This body you were born with and dropped from your mother's womb had a spirit right here ready to enliven that little body, <clears throat> which contained a soul. <clears throat> But it's not the soul that gives the body the spark of life. It's that spirit. See? Now, when you die, that spirit leaves first and goes wherever God wants to put it because it was allowed of God and came from God, but is not the spirit of God. The book of Ecclesiastes, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. <clears throat> Jesus said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. But his soul went down into Hades. The body went a third place. He split three ways. Now I'm telling you right here. It tells you here, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. <clears throat> Come to a complete conclusion of child training that God gets everything out of you that he wants to get out of you. Having put everything in you that he wants to put in you. Now here's where you're standing. As Brother Branham said, I wish I had it with me. I could read it here right now. This uh, spoken, uh, uh, <clears throat> spoken word's original seed. And he said there's a super, super, super race approaching under Christ right now, the headstone. And the headstone is here in the form of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and perfection has come because we have the perfect revealed word of God. And it's not do this and don't do that, the other thing. It tells you the word of God. What does that perfect, what does that perfect word tell you? Let me read it to you over here in the book of Ephesians in case you've got your own ideas. This will tell you what the message is. If you want to know what the message is, brother, you say, Brother Branham, what is your message? I'll tell you what his message is right here. <clears throat> Paul speaking to the church. We cease not to give thanks to make you mention my prayers. Verse 17, first chapter of Ephesians. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And it tells you right there, there is an absolute revelation of God himself in this hour. <clears throat> one, of that one of those revelations under the seventh seal is concerning Melchizedek. And people go along and say, well, this fellow Branham, boy, did he lay a hard-boiled egg. Stupid, stupid, stupid. That shows you what those guys are that get gifts from God and can't handle them. They get high-minded and heady. Now, if they were theologians like us, you a bunch of dirty dogs. Why should I talk about a dog? It's worse than dogs. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Full of their rotten criticism. Sure, Brother Branham made a great mistake as he opened the seals and brought up this junk about Melchizedek. If you understand what I understand this morning, you'll see something to it that the theologian will never see. I'm striving for reality I know that hangs there, and the more I talk about it, the more I'm going to get it. I was a school teacher for a little while. Any school teacher knows the first law of pedagogy is repetition. I don't care who you are. If you're not a good repeater, you never make a good teacher. You don't repeat the same thing like an old saw going ding, ding, ding or something, but you repeat it many different ways, this way, that way. <clears throat> you teach a thing 14 different ways, 15, 20 times if you have to, <clears throat> but you get it across. Brother Branham told the truth what it was here. <clears throat> now here it is, the revelation of him, the eyes your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Do you realize that means it's going to put you back before eternity, before a beginning? <clears throat> That's going to begin to probe the depths of God. You show me a theologian, do it. They can't even tell you what this means. I read all the books. Every time I go to Bible store, I tell you, I pick up the first point, I pick up and see what's he got to say about Ephesians 1, 17, 18. Some will tell you it's a baptism with the Holy Ghost. Some got enough brains to know to tell you, well, the Spirit will reveal something. Now, you, you know, what we should do is get all those books and if those theologians are living, phone them and write them and say, now tell me, kind sir, who is he going to reveal it to? Well, I hate to, you know, act proud, but you know, <clears throat> could be just me. <clears throat> Who's going to believe him? See, the eyes you understand, you may know what his hope is calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. <clears throat> what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, what are those things there? Now, notice when you get that far and only when you get that far and until you get that far, to the absolute revelation, 
he will never get to the next step, which is the resurrection. And the third step is the rapture. <clears throat> he won't get it. Now, let's keep reading. The judge of all, the judge, the, and the spirits of just men made perfect. All right? Now remember, you're looking at the judge. You're looking at Matthew chapter 25, the ten virgin, the five wise and the five foolish. And the cry went out, Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. <clears throat> they all went out. Now five had oil in their containers. Now what is the container of the Holy Ghost? The Word. <clears throat> so therefore, <clears throat> the Word was wrong in five, and it was right in the other five. Because God will not put the Holy Ghost upon a word that is not properly revealed. Now you know that as well as I do. Let's prove it. Back in the days of Moses, there was a man. He went out on, on the Sabbath. He picked up a bunch of sticks to fry his dinner. <clears throat> they said, well, now Moses, there's something in the, the, your, the, your word that you brought us about this man here. According to the word that you brought us, no man is supposed to work on a, on a, on a Sabbath. <clears throat> and this man was working on a Sabbath. So they put him in quarantine. After the quarantine, during the quarantine, Moses went before God and he said, Lord, what about this man? And God said, stone him with stones and he die. He defiled the camp. So they took him out and killed him. Capital punishment. They all had a hand in it because they all threw stones. Now you see, that's pretty tough. It is pretty tough. I'm trying to draw you a picture here. That man did not have the revelation of the word. Yeah, only one man didn't have it. The rest of them did have it. How that one man missed out and everybody else had it is more than I know. <clears throat> That's wonderful. You'd think there would have been a bunch of them. We thank God there's only one. Now, what we're looking at here then at this end time, and which bringing to your attention, is the fact that this, the, the wise virgin have the word of God with the proper revelation because the spirit is in it. The spirit of God is not in a triune baptism. The spirit of God is not in a Trinitarian God. The Spirit of God is not in an organization. The Spirit of God is in only one place, and that is that Word which has been, which is properly revealed. <clears throat> and the wise virgins had it. <clears throat> now, after they consorted with Him, and the and the and the the Christ had taken place, the great marriage supper was about to be entered into. The other five came too late. Sure, they died. What actually happened? They'll come up with the second resurrection. <clears throat> See, they're virgins. They're not out there as a non-virgin, not their serpent seed, they're virgins. They come up, but they come up too late. They are never in the wedding supper, and they're never part of the bride. And their glory is outside, and they can only bring it to the gates. <clears throat> See, let's keep reading here now, because this is where we're at. And to Jesus, you're coming right to Jesus now. Now he's you're coming right to the to the to the first begotten of the dead. Christ is the head, and here he is down here, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. In other words, what you're looking at right now <clears throat> is the plumb full effects of the blood. And the plumb and full effects of the blood is not simply to be make you a Christian, to make you a better person, to make you a loving individual, but is to make you believe the word of God and identify with it according to revelation, not your own mind. <clears throat> so a lot of people that come along and say, well, you know, bless God, <clears throat> I'd just be a fine Christian I, and, and just really show the glory of God. I've done this myself and been very stupid. I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> Lord, if I could glorify your name. Now, you might even think Brother Brano said that. But you better be careful what you think he said because he had to say what Paul said. Okay. You could say, well, Lord God, if I could just be pleasing to you, I would gladly forfeit my life. <clears throat> Apostle Paul didn't say that. He said, I could give my life if possible for my brethren's sake. He didn't say I'd be cast into hell for him. <clears throat> That'd be stupid. The Apostle Paul said, if there be no resurrection, and in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You know why there's a bunch of stupid, miserable Christians? For that very reason. They will not identify with what God said. 
Now, I'm asking this morning, can you identify with Melchizedek, king of peace and king of righteousness? God himself in the form of either a man or something would be a man. Extending to a people <clears throat> his own mercy and grace and ministering to people. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to. So if the days of the Son of Man have appeared on earth again, then God is ministering to his people. <clears throat> oh, you get the latter rainers. They think they know this, but they don't. Pentecost missing a million miles. Because they think they're going to be some form of Melchizedek priesthood, some big faulty raw. If you, you, you want to be a real Melchizedek, start doing things for people. <clears throat> start getting up in the morning thinking not what you want done for you, but what you'd like to do for somebody else. Start thinking like Paul the Apostle said concerning those at work. You don't work just because the boss is around. You work when he's not around. <clears throat> you don't take his time testifying on the job. You spend your own time on some other time testifying. You give dollar per dollar. I don't care what the world does, brother, sister. We're Christians. And you pick up the cross and you suffer. <clears throat> you identify yourself with the one that was rejected. I'm identified with William Branham by the grace of Almighty God because they sure hate him. Now they're really pulling him to pieces. Well, let him do it. <clears throat> That's fine by me. If they do it to us, we'll just have the strength to take it. Don't worry. Now listen. It says right at this time, confronting the whole panorama that God laid out from eternity to eternity, he said, now look, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. When did Jesus Christ, or when did God, I don't care how you put it, when did God ever close his mouth and say, my lips are sealed, I will talk no more? Where do you find it? It puts him in the present tense. It puts him in con continuity of him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him to speak on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him, not the speaker, but the one from heaven. I want to ask you a question. According to the book of Revelation, what happened in Revelation 10 and 1? A mighty messenger, not angel, a messenger came down with a rainbow over his head. And there's only one got the rainbow, and that's God, the one seated on the throne. The one in Revelation 5 became the one in Revelation 10 and 1. Now it says he comes down. It says back there when he was in the form of Jesus Christ, whose voice then shook the earth. It did. It shook it upon Mount Sinai. It brought a great earthquake around the world when Jesus gave up the ghost and cried <clears throat> to God. A great earthquake came. Now, but it promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but heaven also. And this word, which means when he speaks this final time, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you something right there. I think Brother Branham put that into the hands of man, man-made doctrine, but I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to put it right into the hands of God that made everything around here. And I tell you, everything is going to get shaken down, every human being, every building, all the soil, everything. It's going to get shaken, plumbed down, and dissolved. And the only ones that miss it and only things that miss it are the ones standing right in this present hour before Melchizedek, Amen. the priest, God ministering, before the judge. Judge always comes with Son of Man. Before the very presence of the holy city, right at the white throne. I don't understand people how they can talk. And how they can say things when they realize you're right in the presence of God and the white throne. You know something? This generation here doesn't have to have its words brought up like other generations thousands of years back. They take their words right with them, and you and I do too. It's a good thing we got Christ on our side, brother, sister. <clears throat> Yet once more, the things which cannot be shaken remain. That's right. The only hope, my brother, sister, is what? That which has the ability to listen to the word alone remains unshaken. 
How much word do you listen to? How much are you interested in? How much do you talk word? I'm a, I'm a fine one to ask, answer these questions, to ask them. We all stand naked before God today. But remember, Malachi does not fail. There was a people that talked often one to another, and the Lord heard them. And they weren't talking to God, they were talking to each other. And they must have been talking about something that pleased God. Because he said, these are my Jews. And those were the only people who understood righteousness from wickedness. And <clears throat> those who served God and those who didn't. They were the wise virgins. See? Standing right here, not shaken down. <clears throat> Spirits justify. That tricky spirit that plays in your mind through your body would deceive your soul and deceive your very ways. Brother Brandes, I'll tell you how to get the victory over that fella. You just plug every channel of your mind with this word. He said, you mean to tell? I don't mean to tell you nothing has been vindicated. The message of the prophet is the only thing you can plug your mind with. And I can plug my mind with and get anywhere. Isn't it nice to know you're standing where Abraham stood? Oh, he stood in the, he stood in the very presence of God in the form of you man, God ministering to Abraham. And, 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 and there was a miniature city there. They didn't have foundations like yours and mine have. But it was a type, type of Jesus Christ himself ministering through a prophet. There, the pillar of fire. <clears throat> standing right there, the days of the Son of Man back on earth. God's word ministering to a people that said, hey, I'm going to tell you something. Everything gets shaken down but you. Everybody gets shook up at you. And he said, when I come in that cloud of angels, he said, you're going to enter into your rest. Relax. The die's cast, I've made my judgment. Yeah. Into thy presence I come, they sing hogwash. We're in his presence. That's right. Abraham didn't know it for a while. <clears throat> God appeared. It wasn't Abraham appearing. God appeared. Now listen. The 28th verse, I'm going to close. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Are you ready to receive a kingdom? You've always, always wanted one. Some people want to be king so they can lord it over somebody. I'm with Brother Branham. What kind of a spirit's in people that want to take over anybody? I simply don't understand. I am not a true pastor any more than a pastor who teaches, teaches is a true teacher. But he'll teach. I teach, but I can also pastor. But I'm not a pastor like a real pastor is, any more than he's a teacher like I'm a teacher. He can't do it. He doesn't, can't handle the Scripture. It's a gift. It doesn't come by my mind. It comes absolutely by gift. Everything I'm saying, I sat there knowing there'd be strangers in, the, in our group this morning that I've got to preach to, try to give them some insight we're looking at. In 15 minutes, I have to go through one hour and a half. And it all comes together. <clears throat> Look at it. As a pastor, a pre-teacher doing a pastoral work, I can't understand that there could be people who say, I believe this message and split homes and destroy lives and do everything under God's high heaven. Except I know this one thing. Where the sons of God were, the devil came. And ever since then, his devils are still appearing. <clears throat> Well, I just say this one thing. If you're being harassed and you're being bothered by preachers, I'm going to say this one thing to you. You better get your eyes off them and get it on to Melchizedek today. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved and we cannot be moved. Now, listen to me. If there's two things that can't be moved and one is a kingdom and the other is you and I and neither one can be moved, then we're going to go on together. I'm not getting out of the way, and it's not getting out of the way. And we're both controlled by the one that's doing it all. <clears throat> How then can you be disassociated from the fact of New Jerusalem, of which Abraham wanted, and every son of Abraham wants, everybody wants it. Now, it can't be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God, except with reverence and God here, for our God is a consuming fire. The same fire that you see there that brought illumination, brother, sister. You know what it was to Egypt? Darkness. The same one that brought warmth brings death. <clears throat> now, we got a few minutes left. 
Okay, we're going to hit the book of Galatians, and then close for sure. It just came to my mind because it was in my mind as I sat there, so I'm going to bring it in now. <clears throat> the book of Galatians, I think, is around the fourth chapter somewhere in there. I'm not positive. Yes, the fourth chapter. Now, verse, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, till Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now, and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Now, this church here, Love the Apostle Paul till they said, we'll give you our very eyes, a shirt off of our back. Whatever you say, Paul goes. Some smart guy came right around behind Paul, turned the whole bunch around. I wonder if I could put a smart guy in this pulpit and see where you people end up at. I'm not being mean to you. I'm just wondering. I've seen him do it. Get a smooth talker. Oh, such love just drips like honeycomb. And just turn the people's hearts with a blah, blah, blah. The guy's phony as a $3 bill. Couldn't preach the truth if he tried. <clears throat> well, look at that. Love is corrective. Yes, sir. Not hurting anybody's feelings. If I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry about that. Didn't mean to. And I think you're just being petty is all. Nobody's feelings should be hurt this morning. Now, I said, tell me you desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. All right, we've got two women involved here bringing forth sons. But he who was the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Christ wasn't. And Isaac as a type wasn't either because his parents couldn't have any kids. It was not a thing of the flesh. They tried the flesh every old which way. It didn't work out. Ever since there were a couple of young kids, they wanted to have a boy or a girl. It didn't matter. Just give us some children, especially a boy, of course. <clears throat> and a few girls thrown in to be all right, but give me that boy. Carry on the father's name, the father's tradition, the whole thing. Said, no, wait. So that wasn't after the flesh. The flesh couldn't produce it. God had to perform a miracle. But it had to come by flesh, but not by their will. It was the will of God. In fact, Sarah laughed. She said, forget it. So you see what we're talking about? <clears throat> he had two sons, one by a bondman. One, one was born after the flesh, one by promise. That's right, absolutely by promise. Which thing are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. Now, in other words, Moses spoke, Paul spoke of this in, Rome, in, in Hebrews. You are not come, he said, to Mount Sinai, where the bondage is. <clears throat> you are come to New Jerusalem, where the freedom is. Now, just a minute now. You say, just a minute now. The point is, I am, I am God's free man. I'm not in bondage. Oh, yes, you are. You're in bondage to Christ the Word. But that makes you free from everything else. Now, if you want to fool around with some other ideas and think you can make this message with it, I got news for you. You're just kidding yourself. You wait and see. I'm not telling you a lie. You're, I'm telling you the truth. You're going to see very shortly because time can't go on the way it's going on with these AIDS and all. <clears throat> Did you get the last reader's digest and read the poor little boy, the little Mormon boy that got AIDS because of blood transfusions? A hemophiliac. And some of you might think you fool around in adultery. Sure as you're alive, you'll end up dead with the rest of them. Mosquitoes will soon carry it, don't worry. You only got one hope. There's only one hope. Ten thousand fall at the right hand, shall not come nigh to you. The Lord God is your refuge. How are you going to have the Lord God refuge and to turn the word down? <clears throat> How are you going to turn down him to speak it, the one that came down? How are you going to turn him down, the word of God? Vindicated. How many got in the ark? Tell me. <coughs> Seven. Are you kids? Listen to me. Not one in the ark was a baby or a child. They're all adults. So you're trying to scare me? I'm trying to let you know one thing. It's a time for adulthood where every child can understand anything. Better get right with God and keep his life right with God. Because the prophet said there's no rapture till every child, every child of God's brought in and child trained. The child training can be 15 minutes or 20 minutes or overnight. I don't know what's going to be. But I want you to know one thing. That ark is a type somehow. God will take care of our children. But I'm telling you children this. You listen to your parents. And you obey your parents and love this word and don't think you're so smart. Now come on, prove me wrong. Eight people. Eight people, all adults. God looks upon every single one in this hour as a mature Christian. You can be eight years old. You can be ten years old. You can be seven years old. But for your age, you can be absolutely mature in Christ. 
because you've taken a perfect message, a perfect word of God. And you listen. Your parents won't lead you straight. They're not in the business. You be, you'll be an adult before God. He's not speaking to kids in this late hour, little tiny children. Sure he is because you're just chronologically, you're 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age maybe. <clears throat> but you've got a message which is an adult message. That's why there's no Sunday school and all that claptrap and balderdash and garbage. Amen. You sit right here with your parents. You listen. You be good kids. I love you. You're good kids. I know you are. I'm more proud of these kids than anything I'm proud of in this life. Now, there's an allegory here about these two kids that were born. Two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which is bondage, which is human government, man's government. It's where God made a priesthood, <clears throat> finally, where he had men to intervene for men and serve God through men. But New Jerusalem has its own priesthood where God himself serves mankind. Praise God. That's right. It's New Jerusalem, Jesus on the throne, and before we call, God's answer. Rivers flowing, fruit growing, God in his kingdom, everything is right. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and that's our mother. Our lineage, our life, our all in all is from Almighty God. For it's written, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she with hath her husband. But we, brethren, as Isaac, are, are the children of promise. In other words, there's, there's millions out there <clears throat> that don't belong to God. There's millions out there that are going to miss the holy city. You know why? They're not looking for it. They're looking for a wrong rapture. They're looking for a wrong condition of rapture. They're looking for everything wrong. <clears throat> They're looking for great this and great that. They're not identifying with the word of the hour. Listen, my brother and sister. I don't care how much we say we identify with Jesus Christ, with the Lord of glory and all these things. If we don't identify with the word of the hour, where are we? For many years, people have tried to identify with this word at this hour. They haven't been able to. The seven Adventists, I was just a tiny little kid, four years old or five. <clears throat> About what was I? Well, four, four years old. I remember it well. <clears throat> they, they, spent the, they said the very night that, that, that Christ was going to come, and they were all going to go. They went up to the top of the hills. Where I don't know. But the next morning, the sun came up. They were all there. They tried to make Dow Elijah. He said, I am. He wasn't. But does that mean there won't be a real Elijah? There won't be a real appearing? There won't be a real rapture? Certainly there will be. <clears throat> now, we're not saying, hey, join this church. You couldn't join this church if you tried. There's no church here to join. I'm not interested. And thank God you're not. You shouldn't be. If you are, you, you, you're not knowing what I'm preaching in the morning. This is where people say, look, what is this about God anyway? I'm trying to tell you. Since the first time in 2,000 years, since the time of the Apostle Paul, we have had a complete repeat of Scripture in a miniature form, literally from the book of Genesis right to the present hour, where the book of Revelation is open in complete view. The thunders under the seals have come forth, and the Word of God has identified a people. <clears throat> We're identified now in the very presence of God. The judge, white throne, New Jerusalem, resurrection, you name it, the identification is here, for all have, has devolved upon us. Can't you see, brother, sister, that's perfection, that means conclusion? You don't identify with anything less anymore. Now look, we're going to close, but please understand what I'm saying. Until you and I receive this word and close every channel in our minds and our souls, and bring in obedience to the word of God, our spirits. We never will know the, the reality of the revelation which we have received from the prophet. And it is this constant receiving of the word and the constant application to our minds. Because it's by the renewing of the mind the transfiguration comes. The great battle, the battle I mentioned of the eagle last Wednesday, what I was brought up. <clears throat> this is what we're looking at. And my stand has been for the last eight years amongst you. If the word of God doesn't do it, it's not going to be done. I cannot discipline myself and make it happen. I cannot discipline you and make it happen. See? <clears throat> the discipline lies in one channel only, which I must. 
Feed that inner man by the word of God and so must you. And that is what's going to bring forth the transfiguration, the life within the word. That's what the foolish virgin did not have. They never had the Holy Ghost in the word. They had a wrong word. We have a true vindicated word. The Holy Ghost must fill that word and respond to it. And if that word of God is in our minds, it'll be in our hearts. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit will take that word and bring it to life in a human vessel. That's what it did with Jesus. There's no difference. We brother Brown and traced Melchizedek all the way down. So here we stand today with a vindicated word, a word of Almighty God. And the power of God, brother, sister, ready to strike it and bring forth them out of the grave. And they with us cannot be made perfect. And they are perfect. What are you looking for? To be like them. That's the guarantee. That's the guarantee of this hour. And I thrill this morning the best I can thrill. And I'm, I'm just not thrilled as much as I should be. I'm telling you the honest truth. But I tell you, I've got this faith that this word here is going to bring forth in me and then bring forth you what we're talking about today. We're not, we're not dealing here as a social club. We have a lot of fun together. We love each other. We enjoy each other. But I tell you, this, the sobriety of this church lies in the fact we believe in a word that is the word of God that has life in itself. Then that word in us having life in itself will bring forth that word. That's right. Let's rise and be this man. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we know this morning, Lord, there are people here, and we're all here together. And I could name myself and every single one that needs this great revelation, Lord, of this word quickened to us. And we thank you, Lord, has been quickened to the extent that we know that this is the revealed word of Almighty God because you stood behind it when the man said, Thus saith the Lord, what he said came to pass. And you said, When you see that man, you listen to him. And that's what we've done. That's all I've done, Lord, all, the, all these years since I began to realize that this was the one to listen to, that he had something to say, and I appreciate that so much, and the people here are the same accord, and we're very, very appreciative, Lord, and we're appreciative of the fact that it's in your presence we stand today, because you are that one that came down, that, that, this, that has never failed to speak somehow, always speaking through a word for the hour, and now at the end time doing this tremendous thing, and I look upon the Lord and I realize, what in the world could we possibly want more? Where, where, where could we come to you, Father, and say, do something else? In fact, as I look at it, Lord, I'm of this opinion. I, I know that, that I'm wrong and when I even talk to you this way, but there are some things that you did by the prophet that, that as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't even need to be done. Yet other people would need it done, so that takes care of that. What you did in his life in various instances, uh, what I saw <clears throat> was, was enough for me. And what you did in his life for so many others is more than enough for all of us. Just the witness of a sincere person who has any credibility at all would be enough to say, yes, I saw that done, I know it done. For everybody in town to rejoice, a little woman could go with one word that she he had discerned her spirit, looked into her soul and her heart, and she said, come and see a man that told me everything he did, and the whole city turned out. That was enough. So, Lord, here we are this morning in this very condition here. You, you've more than done everything we need. We couldn't possibly come to you and say, now, Lord, do this because we need this done. It's the same, Lord, with healing. It's the same with everything. What, what, what could we come, Lord, after a vindicated message? How could we possibly desire anything other than to say, Lord, be it unto me according to your word? I believe it. The message for healing, the message for every deliverance, the message for every type of... Uh, complex, whatever that is. I don't know. We all got them, Lord. Some crazy thing that we let bug us is what it amounts to, I suppose. I don't know, Lord, but I know these things that when I look at this message here and realize what we've come to, right to the eternal city, right to God, right to the resurrection, right to reaching out, shake Brother Branham's hand pretty soon, Daddy Boss with all those great saints of God. Lord, see Wesley come up in his day and finally see Paul. Oh, God, what an earth-shaking event that's going to be. And realize that we're the ones that are going to see it because we see what, what you bought upon Calvary for. See everything that you was planned in you before the foundation of the earth, and now we've got a glimpse of it. Father, I pray there won't be one person here this morning turns it down. Not one. We know that them coming to any altar, which we don't have anyway, is not the answer. We know the answer is, Lord, to receive you. 
without putting one speck of faith in one step or one raising of one hand or anything at all. But in the heart, looking to you now for a changed life. To get out of here when that trumpet sounds. Taken up to a wedding supper. To be ministered to by God himself. Right to the holy city in three eternity. What a tremendous thing to see, Lord and to realize what you've done in this hour. Bless each one in divine presence, I pray. Go with us, O God. Heal the sick amongst us, Lord. Help us to pray more for one another and be very, very concerned, Lord. Very, very concerned, Lord. We, by now we believe the baby's been brought forth from, from Mary Allison, Lord. We pray, Lord, there's something wrong with that baby, that by your hand right now you touch that child, O God, and reverse every process. Give the doctor what he needs if he needs something, Lord. If something has to come from you, Lord, we can see that too. You know what I've seen, Father, in my own ministry? Uh, there's nothing po impossible, Lord. Nothing. Wouldn't matter what that child was like. There's nothing impossible. So, Father, we commend them to you in each one of us. Now to the King eternal and immortal, but the only wise God be all power, honor and glory through Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus. Christ.